Ah, yes, Civil War reenactments. One of the great traditions of being an American is either participating in a Civil War reenactment or observing one. You see how broadly realistic this one appears to be. We have our Union soldiers and we have our mounted Confederate soldiers. And then we see the other prime factor of evidence for the Civil War in the United States, the many military cemeteries. And to be quite frank, these seem to be the most prominent forms of evidence that we have in the United States that a civil war occurred. However, we're looking much more broadly than that. We're looking at the Reset War of 1847, or more specifically, a broad range of conflicts that occurred across the world from 1847 to 1870. Of course, if you're a frequent watcher of this channel, you know how we feel about years and what the actual dating system says the real year is. But regardless, we're looking to answer the question on what was the primary source of the orphans for the orphan trains. I was asked that question many times after doing the orphan trains video, and I thought that it's also time to cover the aspect of conflict. In the three phases of changing a society, which include conflict, assimilation, and indoctrination, we look at our five eras theory timeline, and we're looking at the contemporary age. We're looking at how we transitioned from the previous age, which we call the Tartarian Age on this channel, but it could have many different names, to our contemporary age. We have three different theories on when the last reset occurred. And again, this is all dependent on a dating system, which may or may not be accurate, or may be completely fraudulent. We just don't know. But we suspect that the reset occurred either in 1850, 1800, or 1750. In today's exploration, we're going to see an abundance of evidence that indicate that it may have occurred in or around 1850. Again, going off of the dating system that we are given and the points of reference that we are given. Now, we're making some broad-based assumptions that these are correct, the dating systems are correct, and the reference systems are correct. There's another video on this channel that you can watch where we talk about the unreliability of the dating system and how we're really dependent upon the good word of many governments and many institutions of course, the ones that preceded our current governments, because we're questioning the trust of governments, and we know that we don't need to question the trust of our current governments. They have many checks and balances in place. But previous governments that our current governments tell us are not reliable. The Reset War, 1847 to 1870. Now, all of these conflicts that we're going to be looking at were conflicts that occurred in the mainstream account. These are all historical conflicts. And we're going to look at each of these conflicts and how they're related. And surprisingly enough, many of these conflicts are related back to the United States Civil War, which is very strange. What does this really tell us about the state of affairs in the land in 1847 to 1870? We start with the United States, the United States Civil War, which seems to be the primary event that was the catalyst for many other events. We're told that this was a great struggle against slavery and that this occurred 1861 to 1865 the North against the South. While that was occurring, we also had ongoing Native American wars, where the United States government attempted to subdue all the Native American tribes, and this was an ongoing conflict. There were conflicts that occurred during the Civil War, after the Civil War, before the Civil War. There was the Mexican War in 1846 to 1848, where a U.S. expeditionary force went to Mexico and defeated it. There was the Walker War, where U.S. filibuster went down to Nicaragua and took it over, a guy by the name of William Walker, and he was defeated by an army led by Costa Rica of all nations. Then there were the Irish raids that occurred after the Civil War. Bizarre. Finally, we go to South America. There was conflict in Chile with the Revolution of 1851. There was the Pereira Revolt in Brazil, 1848 to 1849. And then there was constant conflict in Colombia, 1851 to 1885. So we've already looked at two entire continents, North and South America, what we're supposedly told is the New World, and we see that they are rife with conflict during this particular time. What exactly was going on during the 19th century, or the period of time that we're told is the 19th century? We've only looked at two, con two continents, and we've seen that they've already been overrun with conflict. What about Australia and New Zealand? Well, in New Zealand, we had the Maori Wars, and in Australia, we had the Aboriginal Wars, which were somewhat similar in their ongoing nature to the Native American conflicts in North America. So it's interesting. We have expeditionary conflicts occurring where nations project military power to faraway lands, which is supposedly supposed to be very difficult and require great logistics. And then we also have internal insurrection. 
every type of conflict occurring during the time when technology and communications were supposedly far more limited than they were to this day. Well, let's take a look at another continent. What about Africa? Well, in Africa, we had the scramble for Africa and new imperialism, which supposedly occurred from 1833 to 1914. The brutal and bloody colonialism, which European nations tried to impose their will by carving up pieces of Africa for their own exploitation. And another form of mercantilism, if you will, where the people were either enslaved or they were exploited. No doubt that many examples of this occurred. All right, well, let's try Europe. Well, in Europe, we had the revolutions of 1848 to 1849, apparently a massive social uprising against the ruling order, which supposedly the monarchy defeated, and then the monarchy imposed many of these reforms, bizarrely enough. The United Kingdom, which I say is separate from Europe, had the Chartist revolt or revolution in 1848, where a group of middle-class people tried to revolt. And then there were other wars occurring across Europe, and then even the First and Second uh, Schleswig Wars, which involved the Nordic nations in Germany, oddly enough. Russia was involved in the Crimean War in 1853 and 1856, which was another large-scale conflict uh, facing the United Kingdom and France, almost a precursor to many other conflicts to come in the future. And then there was the ongoing Caucasian War, where the Russians were supposedly trying to destroy and defeat many different groups of people who had been forgotten to history. And this had been an ongoing war for many decades prior to this period. And yet, when we open up to this period, this war is ongoing. So we see all of this conflict, and to be fair, there is far more detail that I'm covering here. We're just looking at these conflicts in totality. Well, let's go to Asia proper. We have the Indian Rebellion, also known as the Sepoy Mutiny, 1847 to 1848. China, we have vast conflict, the Taiping Rebellion, 1850 to 1864, which supposedly killed 20 to 30 million people. The Second Opium War, where we had numerous nations, once again, United Kingdom, France, I'm using modern names that say simple, supported by the United States, 1856 to 1860. In Japan, we had the Japanese Civil War, 1850 to 1864, and then a few short years after that, the Meiji Restoration, where the Tokugawa shogunate was overwhelmed, and they had a return to the emperor's authority. These are all historically documented conflicts, and you can see that every single continent in the world between the years of 1847 and 1870 were rife with conflict. And not just regional conflicts, these were external conflicts, these were expeditionary conflicts. Was this really what we're told, or was this the Reset War from 1847 to 1870? The agenda with which to destroy the remnant enclaves of the previous civilization that did not go with the Reset. Now there's a lot of evidence that we can consider that shows that this, that this is indeed what occurred. We have all these conflicts that occurred in a short period of time. Consider the analogy of all the city fires that we have, and we look at how if you change one of the five W's, who, what, when, where, and why, you can suddenly change the how. Now imagine if the W, the when, on these conflicts was changed. Imagine if all these conflicts occurred within a much shorter period, say five to ten years. Would we consider this a world war? Consider how many of the leaders in Europe who were connected with the revolution of 1848 to 1849 actually ended up becoming significant Union Army officers in the United States during the United States Civil War. Eight out of ten pictured here became very prominent Union Army officers. No, none served with the Confederacy. They all served with the Union. And you can see them in the Union Army uniforms. It's an intriguing premise, and what's this really saying? They failed in the revolution, supposedly in Europe, although the monarchies that defeated them including some of the most fanatical monarchs, ended up imposing many of these reforms, and we're told they just had no choice to do it. It's a fascinating dichotomy. We also look at the casualties from 1800 to 1899, and of course we see in the early 19th century the Napoleonic Wars supposedly produced the most casualties, but are they even counting any of the casualties that occurred in China? 20 to 30 million would take you well off this chart, or are they just saying that they're spread out? Ascertaining the number of casualties is always very difficult. Whenever you look up a single conflict, say the United States Civil War, depending on the day and the source, you'll get a vast disparity in the number of casualties reported. And of course, they'll try telling you, well, we're reevaluating the number of killed, wounded, died of wounds, sick, injured, etc. And it's a very interesting consideration because they're supposed to be historians. Well, let's look at some pictures of these conflicts, and we'll start with the Crimean War. And we look at this picture and we see what appears to be some sort of expeditionary force, although these are some of the earliest pictures that were supposedly taken, and we have to consider the detail that we see with the land and these ships. 
what's exactly going on here? Does this really look like an organized military expedition? Now, of course, the historical account will tell us, well, the United Kingdom hadn't participated in a war for some time, and they were simply out of practice. It had been since the Napoleonic Wars and Wellington's great victory at Waterloo that the United Kingdom's great military machine had gotten to exercise itself. Look at this intriguing building. Sort of a pyramid building that looks like it uh, is supposed to serve as both a church. I wonder, did they just affix a cross on top of it, or was it always there? Supposedly, this is from the Crimea. Although, one wonders on the authenticity, first and foremost, of these pictures. I guess you can actually see clouds on it, which is always a unique aspect with these older pictures. And what's the actual date on it? And the location? Because the reality is anybody can associate anything with any image that they want to. And that's something that we always keep in mind on this channel. And it's important to always ask questions and not be solidified into a particular belief. Because if we look at how all systems operate... Here's another picture of what appears to be port operations, and here perhaps we can see maybe a little bit more of an example of an initial military expedition in the Crimean War. And we see some armed sailing ships in the background, which look like they have cannons in them. They're cramped awfully close together, but perhaps that was the realities of the port. We can understand that. It looks like we see some sort of very rudimentary rail checks right in front there, where they're offloading what appears to be the supplies in the crates. There's many different movies that try to give an interpretation as to what happened during the Crimean War, and they're quite fascinating in how they seem to depict a historical narrative. One of the most legendary aspects of the Crimean War is the Charge of the Light Brigade. And here, looking at these uniformed British soldiers, we see a vast array of uniforms, and yet, does this really look practicable? It's the same questions that we have when we look at the United States Civil War. Yet, oddly enough, there's also something similar about this disparity of uniforms. Is this really one nation's military? Or is this some other military that was actually engaged in an expeditionary operation? Many of these photos give clues that there could be something else entirely going on. And yet, for many people to even ask these questions, they find it very offensive and absurd. Now, if these conflicts did occur as we're told, I don't mean to question the bravery or the valor of these veterans. But we have to ask questions about this because then we see images like this. Look at how well built up that building is or that post is in the background. And we have, of course, cannons and then the very well stacked cannon balls. They look, they're in position to conduct some sort of siege or to bombard the fort. It doesn't look like the cannons are actually in position to defend the fort, but who really knows? We always get so many conflicting accounts with many of these so-called pictures that we have. And here we have more of the classic vanilla sky where you can't see a cloud and you certainly can't see what's on the distant horizon. I wonder why. Yes, people say I wonder a lot, but if you're not wondering a lot, then you're just taking all these pictures at face value and you're never really going to get anywhere. This is an interesting one because we see what's supposedly a defensive position, a very well built up readout. We're told that the United States Civil War is really the first modern war where they experienced trench warfare towards the end of it, and yet this looks a lot like trench warfare to me. But, I don't know, maybe they just didn't count it as trench warfare because there weren't an extensive series of trenches. Ask a military historian and they'll tell you ten different things depending on when you ask them and what conflict you're asking them. And no, I don't say that as a derogatory remark towards military historians. I'm merely saying that to consider the fact that there are many different perspectives, even in the mainstream, about what actually happened in these conflicts. Look at how many times the account of World War II has changed in terms of what actually happened, and that was a conflict that only occurred about 80 years ago. Here we see more soldiers, and they look like they're uniformed a little bit more <laughs> uniformly, if you'll excuse the pun. Yet, again, we always get the same feeling that we do when we look at American soldiers in the U.S. Civil War. And again, these are British soldiers, or so we're told. Who really knows? It seems like they're just having a grand old time, and, you know, war is just really a great old vacation. Although, if you watch many of those movies about the Crimean War from whatever time frame in the previous decades, it gives you the impression it really wasn't a very fun conflict. And then you also have accounts that medical services were very poor. And you look at a picture like this, and again, you get this impression of the attempt of logistics. Why do all these cannonballs look so old, as though they've been sitting there for decades? Well, you know, it was just very dry and arid, and the wind blew some dust on them, and they just left them there. I wonder who actually piled all those cannonballs there. It just looks like a pile of junk, as though something has hit the land, and people are simply responding to it. You also see what looks to be a steam stack in one of the ships in the background. Now, yes, we're told they had that technology at the time, and the Industrial Revolution had occurred, of course. 
Yet there's just so many anomalies in this picture to include even the structure in the background. And this is supposedly a picture of combat from the Crimean War. Although this is a bit of a rendering, it appears to be mixed with a little bit of a real-life photograph. It's hard to tell. And that's another ambiguity with these photos. And we always talk about or lament the fact that we don't have actual combat photos from the United States Civil War or the Crimean War. Yet again, this gives me the nature that this is potentially trench warfare, if this is indeed how it happened, although who knows if this is how it happened. If you're in a military expedition and you're attempting to conquer a land, are you really just going to dig in and sit around and do trench warfare? Or are you going to use maneuver warfare? Oh well. Military historians can correct me in the comments. I'm sure they'll enjoy it. Let's go to Japan and the Meiji Restoration. Now, the interesting thing about Japan was that it was under the rule of the Tokugawa Shogunate, and if you've ever read James Clavell, he details it very well, albeit with alternate names in the book Shogun, about how Japan had fallen under the rule of the Shogun, or military dictator, instead of the emperor. Japan is such an interesting place because, to this day, it has a very strong culture and a strong sense of identity, and we see beautiful architecture. And this is typically the kind of architecture that we associate with Japan, these sort of castles, whether it's Osaka Castle or Tokyo or Yedo. This is Commodore Perry, and he led the U.S. military expedition to open Japan to the world. Very fine photograph. He looks like a very squared away and stern U.S. naval officer. I like how he has one button unbuttoned, and it looks like he has another button not quite buttoned all the way. I don't know, maybe he was just a comfortable kind of guy. He looks like he was very easygoing, very jovial. You would think, though, that if he was taking a professional photograph, and given the amount of time that they put into professional photographs, he would make sure that all his buttons were buttoned, and he would look professional and stern. But perhaps because he had the name Perry, because Perry is a traditional U.S. military name, going back to the War of 1812, another interesting conflict in and of itself, he didn't have to have his uniform fixed up properly for his picture. And here we see this opening of Japan. There was no real contact between the United States and Japan, at least no formal diplomatic relations, until this Perry expedition occurred, again in the 1850s. And Perry apparently forced Japan to accept him, and they just let him in there, even though, according to historical accounts, Japan was very distrustful and reluctant to allow foreigners in their land. Can't imagine why they would feel that way. And for some reason, they just decided to respect this ebullient and very brash U.S. naval officer who put on such a great display that apparently it somehow intimidated the Japanese. Very interesting account. And these are some of the earlier pictures that we see of Japan from the 1860s and 1870s. And again, we see a very well-built-out and developed infrastructure. Many power lines, tracks, and well-built-out buildings. Not exactly what we'd expect to see for the 1860s, 1870s in Japan. But again, there could be something off on the dating on the photo. It could be from the early 20th century. It's just strange, and again, we have many conflicting accounts from this, and when we consider this account of these conflicts that we're looking at, we wonder, is this an accurate photo, or is this something else that's trying to give us a different impression of what Japan was? Or is this really what Japan looked like in the 1860s and 1870s? Well, if this is really what Japan looked like, we have a very conflicting account. And again, another picture of what we're told is supposed to be part of one of the imperial areas in Japan after the emperor had retaken power from the Tokugawa shogunate. And there's many movies made about that. Perhaps the most recent one is The Last Samurai, which is supposedly from that time frame, although it's a, quite an interesting movie, especially when you consider some of the scenes from it. But look at that structure there, that archway. There are parts of it that have a very different construction appeal to it, and there's other aspects to it that don't really show what they're really doing. So I'm trying to wonder, what exactly is this showing? Now this is the steam engine that uh, Commodore Perry apparently brought along with him. Now imagine loading the steam engine on and off a sailing ship, even a steam-driven one, because Commodore Perry was a big proponent of steam-driven ships. Look at the date on that. 1883? Or is that an I? Come see our amazing steam engine from 1883. It's from the future. Was Commodore Perry a time traveler too? Or is this an old date? What depiction is this miniature steam engine even from? Because that's what we're told that it is. Is this an American depiction? A Japanese depiction? Something else entirely? Is that really an I? Well, if you're interested in the dating system, check out our dating video on the channel. The Taiping Rebellion. Lots of conflict in China during the 19th century. There was an internal conflict between the Qin Dynasty and the Taiping Rebellion. 
Now, details of this conflict seem to be a little difficult to come by, especially if you're not actually in China, but apparently this was a violent internal conflict that involved large armies. Naturally, there's no pictures of it. We only have depictions like this. So if anybody speaks uh, Chinese or is familiar with Sino history from this period of time, I'll admit that I haven't studied it. I have some bare bones knowledge on what I'm told on the historical account is, so I welcome comments. Yet it seems like it was a very brutal conflict, and some accounts say that 20 up to nearly 30 million Chinese died in this conflict. It sounds far more brutal than the United States Civil War was, which even at the highest end was a million Americans that had died. So what was really going on during this time frame? It's very difficult to decipher if these conflicts were what we're told they were, or, again, were these conflicts really an expeditionary force that was going about destroying the enclaves, the remnants of the previous civilization. When you factor in even the historical account that there's only 23 years dispersing these conflicts, and many of them occur during the same time frame, you're given the impression that it seems like there's a lot of holdout enclaves. There are settlements with walls around them that are under siege. And why would that come up as a recurring theme? And it seems to be a recurring theme in many of these conflicts. I'm simply trying to interpret what data that we have. It's very difficult to get a clear picture. And that's why this kind of research can be very ambiguous and, to be honest, frustrating at times. We just want some clear answers. We would like some solid answers, some solid evidence that tells us what's really going on. Okay, if this was a civil war in China, we understand it's a terrible thing, war. And yet, it seems as though the entire land during this time frame was just overwhelmed with war, internal and external conflict. Why is it now it seems as though everyone, at least in the Western world and modern media sources, are perfectly content to have all their attention focused on one regional conflict, which on the surface is only really between two nations? Yet during this time frame, it seems as though we have more conflict than we did in World War I and World War II combined. A lot of alternative researchers will point back to what was called the Seven Years' War, or the French-Indian War, depending where it was, 1756 to 1763, and state that that was World War Zero. And here's one of the few pictures that we have of the revolutions of 1848, and this was the Chartist movement in the United Kingdom. Very interesting. This seems like a photo, although does it really seem like a photo? We've looked at it before on this channel. See a very large compound in the background with some impressive buildings and a large smokestack. We see many individuals wearing top hats, and supposedly this is a meeting of the Chartists, the group of people that wanted more rights, especially for the middle and lower classes, or so we're told, and that supposedly this was an offshoot of the social upheaval that was occurring in Europe in 1848, even though this is in the United Kingdom. Now, the revolutions of 1848 are something you will find virtually no pictures of, and in my research I could not really find any pictures, and these were a series of uprisings that occurred against the aristocratic governments across many nations of Europe, Austria, Denmark, and again we have the same kind of pictures. It looks like there are settlements that are under siege or being assaulted. What exactly is going on here? We also have a similar feeling or theme that we have in the United States Civil War. And of course, many people will be saying, well, it's in the same time frame, they wore the same uniforms, they used the same tactics. What's interesting, though, is the vast disparity in casualties that you get in many of these conflicts. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. But look at this and look at some of these uniforms. Even though this is in Europe, there is a very distinct feeling of and I'm not trying to offend anybody, I'm just calling what I see. It almost feels like this is something else from the United States Civil War. If you change those flags to red, right, and red, white, and blue and put stars on them in the field, you have to wonder, is this really depicting this kind of conflict? Is this really what was going on? I mean, yes, these are all just drawn and painted pictures. Anybody could do these pictures. They could be from any time frame. They could say anything. Yet, this is what's being depicted and shown to us. And again, more uprisings and more cities. Again, again, and again. Whether it's pictures, whether it's drawn pictures or paintings or some combination using some means that we don't fully understand, we see a plethora of evidence that shows similar uniforms, similar tactics, and similar types of operations, which seems to involve either sieges or assaults on cities or settlements, occurring all across the land. That's the key theme that's very difficult to neglect 
when you consider all these conflicts. It's strange enough that they all occurred within such a compressed time frame. According to the mainstream historical account from 1850 to 1870, or 1848 to 1870, or whatever years you want to go by, but then not trusting when the years actually occurred and seeing our little miniature steam engine before, it makes us call into question the actual dates and the years and what was really going on during this time frame. If you could insert a year or two into a time frame, or if you could simply report events occurring on different years, how difficult could you make it to track the actual course of true historical events? Now, of course, people will say that this is absurd, that that would never happen, there's too many overlapping authorities, and there's too much collaboration. Yet here, when you look at this picture, again, I see uniforms that look very similar to what the Union Army wore in the United States Civil War. But of course, you can see whose flags are back there, and you know this is not depicted in the United States. But something about it has a similar feeling to it. It's also intriguing when you consider the fact that so many foreign nations sent officers that served in the United States Civil War, and they were already wearing similar uniforms in the years beforehand. Perhaps I'm simply reading too much into it, yet why in all these photos do these all look so much the same? And this is about the only picture we'll get of the Caucasian War in Russia, which is merely a painted picture where we see the type of conflict that was going on there. It was a long-running, brutal conflict and supposedly had denigrated to the status of a genocidal war. Although, looking at the overall scope of these conflicts, you have to question if this was a genocidal war across all the lands. Because when we look at how the casualties have vast disparities in them, and I'll give an example. In the United States Civil War, we're told anywhere from a half a million to a million Americans died. And then in the conflict that occurred in Canada, immediately following that, we're told that only 37 people died when this uh, Irish nationalist force from the United States invaded Canada and had to be defeated by the Canadian militia. Yes, this really happened, 1866 to 1871. I guess uh, President Grant didn't opt to stop this or was too busy with other matters. The Opium War in China is quite intriguing as well, and we do have some photos from that because that's another foreign expedition. So while there was this large uprising against the legitimate Chinese government at the time, 1850 to 1864, there was also this foreign expedition. Now there had been an earlier Opium War. This was the second one where the United Kingdom and France, and then with some help from the United States, were involved in China. This is really interesting because you can look at the historical accounts, you can do all your appropriate research, and yet you have to accept the fact that there are overlapping conflicts occurring. There are foreign forces that are involved in a nation while that nation is trying to suppress insurgents or rebels within its own borders. So every type of conflict, every type of destruction, every type of death that we can imagine, what does this really tell us about what's going on in the 19th century, and I think this is some of the most substantial evidence that we can have. Consider this opium war where we have the picture here of the well-uniformed trade and led British army fighting with the Chinese forces. And then of course we see, look at the architecture. Now again, this is a painted picture, so who knows about the veracity of it, and this could be dramatized. Yet our mainstream account tells us that these events all really happened within close proximity of each other on the dateline. It's another example of the more questions we ask and the more research that we do, if we actually ask questions about it and consider it within the realm of logistical limitations, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And here we actually have a photo showing some destruction and some death from supposedly the Opium War, although who knows, was it the Opium War in China? Was it part of this overall greater United States Civil War? Or was it really this worldwide expeditionary force that was all operating on the same orders, on the same agenda, to destroy the remnants of the enclave of the previous civilization? Because there's no shortage of cemeteries, and there's no shortage of memories or records from these conflicts. And here's the other aspect of it. A lot of alternative researchers will tell you that you have to completely disregard history if you're going to be successful or effective in this kind of research. My approach, though, has been 
Consider the fact that what if what they're telling us does have a lot of half-truths or even quarter-truths in it. Now, what do I mean by that? Think on the fact that if someone could show you a little bit of evidence that something's true, they can't show you evidence that it's completely true, but they can at least show you one thing that something's true. Here's an example. There's a cemetery. There's names on it. There's ranks on it. There's dates on it. This is a cemetery from the United States Civil War. This is from the Battle of Vicksburg. This is from the Battle of Shiloh. Or in China, this is from the Battle of Beijing or whatever. And then on top of all that, we're told that we have global temperature change. That occurred very significantly in the 1840s to the 1850s with the ending of the Little Ice Age. Now, who knows if this is accurate data from the time frame, but again, we're told by our mainstream accounts that this is very accurate and that there was an extreme temperature change at the time with the Little Ice Age finally ending in the mid-19th century. Strangely enough, that overlaps with this period of conflict that we were just looking at from 1847 to 1870. And we have pictures like this, which show what was still going on in places across Europe, the United Kingdom, the United States, where areas were very cold and they were iced over for a grand period of time. Now, granted, you could still go there during winter, potentially, and see this happening. And I've had some viewers tell me, well, there's just extreme weather factors that can hit places at certain times. And yes, this is all true. But at the same time, this is what our official account tells us happened. That this little ice age finally came to an end, and this time frame just happened to overlap with this period of intense conflict. Really a world war, if you want to think about it, and something far more brutal than a world war. Oh, and let's also bring up the 1859 Carrington event. The 1859 Carrington event, supposedly there were fluctuations from the sun that caused massive disruptions in telegraph communications. Yet, oddly enough, when you try to verify this event in local media sources, looking at newspapers from the time, whether it's from the United States or Europe, it becomes very difficult to verify that this event truly occurred. Now, if someone out there has some sort of access or some sort of ability to look at different sources and give indications from the time frame that the Carrington event truly occurred, then, by all means, share in the comments. It's just strange, though, to consider that. And now let's go back and look at some of these pictures from the time frame of these intense conflicts. So we've had vast climate change supposedly occurring. We've had the Carrington event that hasn't occurred yet at the time of this photo. And we have all this conflict. And yet here's what a cathedral in Baltimore, Maryland looked like in 1856. Very beautiful, very well built out. I like the brick there, the nice beautiful red brick. And look at that light right there. Of course, we'll just be told that it's a gas light and they had to light it every night. Whether it's a gas light or not, it's irrelevant. Look at the construction that we have within these buildings and the layout of the street and the sidewalk. Some of it looks like it's very beautiful and brand new and other parts look very old. Then we go to Paris and we see how things looked there in 1857. We see very well built out buildings and we see an amazing variety in architecture. But we have to remember there's all these conflicts that were going on. There was this massive social uprising that occurred in 1848 across all of Europe. And there was supposedly climate change and everything else going on. And yet, I mean, granted, this is another one of those questionable photos because you don't see the detail in the sky so well. Yet we know and believe that there are buildings like this. There was infrastructure like this. And then the Great Eastern at London's Millwall Iron Works and the River Thames in 1857. Again, while the United Kingdom was busy with all of its uh, overseas expeditions and everything else that it was doing, tell me, does this really look like this ship is under construction, or does it look like this ship is being salvaged? Strangely enough, at how old that large chain over there looks. And I love how we always have the individuals with top hats that are always just sort of hanging around, supervising, or, I don't know, maybe just getting in the picture. It almost looks like there's some sort of survey going on here, and they're all just posing. As though these are explorers who had just arrived in this land and they want to see what they have. And then let's uh, not uh, forget the other great achievements of France. Supposedly they built this incredible viaduct in 1861 to 1863. After the Carrington event, uh, after all the all these social upheavals and all this conflict, they managed to do all this. 
It's when you start to take these overlapping factors into account that we're told from the official historical narrative. That alone, regardless of whatever you think about the actual years or dates, that's where you have to start asking some very hard questions. Because the more you look at this, the more detail that you look at it within, you start to have more questions. Again, looking back at Paris, and we see what a beautiful modern city it looks like in 1857. Fairy tale towers everywhere you look. Well, it's Cathedral of Notre Dame, so it was always well built out, and it was amazing what they can do. Yes, of course. And people will tell you it was all because of the Industrial Revolution, and we could achieve great things in the Industrial Revolution. Well, tell me, was the Cathedral of Notre Dame built before or after the Industrial Revolution? I'll just leave it at that. I like the road there where it looks like there's a lot of mud or dirt on it, but I don't know, maybe that was just horse and carts riding across. Look how beautiful and modern those bridges look, though, across the river. Very intriguing and very well in depth. So going back to the five eras theory, I think we have a lot of evidence that the reset occurred in or around 1850, maybe five, ten years before or five to ten years after. Who knows for sure? And I'm basing this on the amount of conflict that we have from 1847 to 1870. I'm basing this on the fact that they tell us there was a major climate shift that may have occurred for a variety of reasons in the years leading up to this. And I'm also basing this on the Carrington event. These events all seem to correspond. Now, could it be possible these are all just false flags or misleading information that we're given? Absolutely. There's a reason why I don't tie myself too hard to these beliefs. We are doing alternative research, which is based on theory and conjecture. We have to ask questions and we have to keep exploring. That is how we're going to find the true answers to many of these mysteries. And these are going to continue to be mysteries no matter what we do. Now consider, I've gone back and I've actually looked at my major theories for what's the reason for the existence of Tartaria in the old world. And oftentimes I go to theory one, we've experienced five ages or eras of time. But the more I look into things like this, Sometimes I wonder if it's theory three. Are we living in a simulation? Why do we have so many inconsistencies with our timelines and so many reality glitches? And depending on who you talk to, different people have experienced different realities. And they really believe that they have experienced different realities. It's not something that people are making up. Now, of course, you can just sit there and pretend that everything is just fine. And it's just because people have fallacies in their memory. But, of course, these are the same people that will be told that other fallacies or things that conflict are true because certain authority figures tell them that that's the way things should be. And they will not question it. And, of course, you can see these real-life examples every day. I don't have to tell you examples of people simply adhering to authority. Just go out and walk around and you'll see it. Or is it possible we're living in a dream, our own or another? You know, I always keep these theories on the table because when you look at all this conflicting information and you see just this one historical account of a time frame from 1847 to 1870, 23 years, it's a lot of questions that come up. And I think this is one of the things that shows why we have all these questions. Now, going back to the original point of this exploration, the origin of the orphans, I have some theories to explain where these orphans came from. Now, I believe there were two different phases of the orphan trains. There was the initial phase in 1850 to 1870 and a subsequent phase that occurred all the way as far as the 1930s and the 1940s. And here are the major theories. One, the reset war destroyed remaining enclaves of last civilization. So what remained of Tartaria that didn't go along with the reset, it had to be destroyed. Prisoners were taken in mass from these conflicts going on across the lands. And many of them were taken to either asylums or prisoner of war camps, where many died. Orphans from across the land were shipped to New York City. And there they were distributed across the United States. Because for whatever reason, the plan that they had indicated the United States was going to be settled from people from across the world. Now, going back to the orphan trains, people say that in the pictures they only see one particular type of appearance of human being. And that's very true. However, just because there's a lack of pictures of other types of human beings doesn't mean that they weren't part of the orphan trains as well. For example, just because the media doesn't talk about a certain conflict going on in a certain part of the world doesn't mean there's not a conflict going on, right? In any event, it's hard to say exactly what the reality of the situation was. But I suspect that the reason that they do this is just to keep people questioning and just to sow division, as because what you display in pictures can always be questioned and it can always cause people to question their status in life and stay more concerned about questioning their trust in each other as opposed to questioning trust in, we'll just say institutions, perhaps they're not supposed to. 
Finally, what's the repopulation aspect of this? Consider if we had a reset and a worldwide conflict, we know that many human beings died. We're under the impression, and this is reinforced by the fact, that labor was required, especially in certain areas of the world, and they used child labor quite extensively. The orphan trains initially were designed to provide child labor, and it seems they were provided to induce diaspora and dysphoria amongst the people. There's also the fact that uh, there was a vast population influx in the United States through San Francisco, as we talk about how the Transcontinental Railroad was supposedly constructed by two different ethnic groups of people working from the east and the west and meeting in the middle. Well, what's the truth and the reality to it? We just don't know. We have all these hints and all these clues, and this is why we have to keep doing this exploration. I hope today's exploration provided a theory, though, for where these orphans may have come from. And... Could they have grown additional people in test tubes using alchemical processes that would have provided more of a population or the incubator babies? Absolutely. And I believe that was a subsequent phase to the plan when they required more people and more labor in certain areas that were depopulated from all this conflict and everything else that was going on as part of the reset. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments. Consider joining the channel as a member. You can be an explorer and receive early access to content, or you can be a prime explorer and have exclusive content that you can't watch on the regular channel. As always, ask questions, explore yourself, and you restore the world. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you for joining me today.